Hey, welcome to It Is What It Is. I'm Corbin. And I'm Anthony. And today we have a interesting conversation I think uh, you'll all enjoy. And that's this uh, discussion about players uh, being kind of broken down into two categories. They're either like naturally skilled or, or sorry, naturally talented or they're skilled. And typically, well, when you think of naturally skilled players, you think of like super athletes, uh, guys who kind of come in and they're like already really good at some things. You think of like Zion Williamson, LeBron James, Russell Westbrook, these guys who are like naturally talented. They have like phenomenal court vision. And then there's the the skilled camp, which is guys like Steve Nash, Chauncey Billups, guys who take a while to like develop in the league, but then they turn into all stars. Yeah, no, I think, uh, thank you so much. I think this is a really interesting topic. And part of it is when we treat talent like a natural gift. Um, and we, we have this perception that there's an inequality, even if there's an equality of dignity of human persons, there's an inequality in what people are, are gifted with when they're born. So some people have natural abilities or proclivities. And especially we, we hear about this when we see um, a child that's really good at something at a young age. And we think there's, you know, there's no way they've had a lifetime to develop the talent or the skill to be able to do that. So it must be a natural innate talent. Um, so I think this, it is what it is, uh, applies in the sense that both the person who's talented may take for granted that talent. And thus uh, we, we have the concern about lost potential and what does it mean to have potential. Uh, and also there might be this kind of the person who doesn't feel as naturally gifted uh, might resign themselves to say, well, I can never be that or do that. It's, you know, and so they don't um, participate or, or try at something that they might enjoy and love. So um, maybe just acknowledging or, or treating this natural gift as innate uh, leads to the kind of resignation that we brought up previously with it is what it is. I do want to uh, just briefly talk about Malcolm, Malcolm Gladwell's book, uh, Outliers, where he talks about this idea of prodigies and people that were uh, – recognized for being extremely talented at a young age uh, or that kind of led their field even at, as a, in adulthood, they were so far ahead of everyone else that it just seemed like there's something special there, something uh, unnatural or maybe uh, natural in an in a innate kind of way. But what he discovered when he was looking at these individuals was how much time they spent on their craft even at a young age. So the magic number he came up with, and, and it's just... I think an estimate of uh, or an analysis of how long it takes for someone to get good at, at the thing that they're good at uh, was 10,000 hours. So the Beatles, for instance, spent so much time practicing as teenagers or Bill Gates uh, spent that much time messing around with computers so that uh, a college education wasn't as necessary for him to exhibit the kind of ingenuity and skill with computers, for instance. Or with the Beatles, they were able to uh, tour, tour globally and, and uh, break all kinds of standards of music when they were just exhibiting uh, familiarity with pop music, blues, and the history of, of rock music. So uh, that being said, uh, the question then is, is there really a difference between talent and skill? Uh, do we think that maybe that difference has been overblown and therefore we should not think of it as it is what it is, but rather recognize the hard work that goes into developing one's talents into skills? Yeah, that's a, a good way to phrase it. And I just want to clearly state that we're definitely not going to answer that question. But <laughs> we, will, <laughs> we will hopefully lay out some uh, perspective that will help you, you know, redefine this for yourself. But um, I wanted to touch on something that you said, you know, I think one thing that like relays this, it is what it is concept to this question is that, um, you know, kind of when you say that somebody is naturally talented, you're kind of disregarding all the work that they put into getting to that point already. So it is sort of this like resignation slash, uh, I don't, I don't want to say like completely giving up, but like, like you said, it's just like, admitting to the fact that this person like maybe had some opportunities earlier in their life that you didn't have. And so you're, you are kind of like uh, articulating this inequality, <clears throat> but it's not like an inequity that is non overcomable. I mean, we certainly see it, right? You talk about guys who are uh, naturally talented, but they don't succeed in the NBA. Like uh, Darius miles comes to mind. He was like a favorite of mine, super athletically gifted was actually a pretty good shooter. Maybe like, 
you know, if he played today, he would have a much better career. But he also had some, you know, some issues on and off the court. And all of those factors weigh in. But you don't get to that point of your life, you know, getting into the NBA without having spent, you know, 10,000 hours or more uh, perfecting your craft. Uh, One story that you hear all the time is these guys, they start at such a young age playing basketball, like three, four, five years old. So, of course, they're going to have like hours and hours of of basketball time. And they get to a point where probably around like elementary or middle school where they're like their life is the basketball court. And so, you know, from even from a talented point of view, they are probably disappointed if they don't get to the NBA. I'm sure there's like a billion people who who are naturally talented, who are naturally talented. And then they don't even get like a look when it comes to the NBA draft. Yeah. I just want to chime in real quickly with that. One of my favorite movies like growing up was the Maravich story and seeing him riding his bike, dribbling a basketball and making sure that he was dribbling with both hands and, and working on his weak side so that he was ambidextrous and, and all the time and energy that he put into that. And of course it was a biopic. So there may have been fictional elements to that or whatever, but uh, I, I hear the same thing with Luka Doncic that uh, he does all these crazy trick shots, but in part because he's just spent so much time in the gym moving the ball in every possible way off the backboard, off the rim, uh, you know, what it looks from different perspectives. And there's no uh, trade-off for that kind of experience and repetition. Uh, you get familiar with something and, and it's going to seem second nature to you. Um, so, you know, I came across, this question came up because I came across this thread on Reddit. Uh, Reddit uh, Between like, uh, it was like looking at natural talent versus skill. And uh, Chauncey Billups came up in there. And I know Steve Nash is constantly talked about as like somebody who has, uh, you know, who's worked hard and has skill. But Chauncey Billups, I thought, was a really good example because he's probably about like average athleticism in the NBA. Um, And he didn't make an all star team till like his like, I think it was his seventh or eighth season in the NBA. He was with the Pistons and they had just won the championship. And that's when he became like known as Mr. Big Shot. Whereas, and then I thought immediately of like Russell Westbrook as the other end of the spectrum. Pick number three in the draft. Actually, I think Billups was picked pretty high too. Um, pick number three in the draft immediately came in uh, with his athleticism. Um, but to me, like he, while he has risen in stature in the game, like his game is essentially the same as it was back then. He's just more clever now with how he uses it. Like he still crashes the boards. He still runs like a freaking locomotive towards the hoop. Um, You know, but he doesn't really do any of the other things that would come with all of this extra experience. Like he doesn't shoot better than he did back then. In fact, a lot of people I think would say that he shoots worse now. And so his shooting is down and, you know, obviously his, uh, his athleticism is going to wane in the next couple of years. Um, so this is why it really started sparking this debate for me was like, you know, you could say he was naturally talented or you could acknowledge that he spent hundreds of hours in the gym to build up that athleticism. And then his basketball skill set basically is that of a playground player. Yeah. You know, he worked r- really hard on his athleticism and then he just didn't work on his, his shooting at all. I think those are good examples. And I'm excited to hear what you have to say for, um, I think you had some other background information about about this idea. Yeah, I wanted to bring up uh, some educational theory. And it's, it's like a big part of my job now is to kind of um, throw away this idea of natural talent in favor of this other idea that is um, any trait that you desire can be a learned skill. And, you know, you, you mentioned Bill Gates earlier, and I thought that was a perfect example because everybody thinks of him as like a prodigy and he's a brilliant person, um, right? But he, in his youth, probably had opportunities that most other people either don't have or they don't take. So, you know, he tinkered. It's kind of well famous that he like tinkered in his garage and developed like Microsoft DOS. Um, anyway, so he, but there's like a lot of time you spend in that environment just to be able to figure something out like that. And I think now it's really well regarded that uh, coding is a skill and not a talent. And so there's been this like paradigm shift over the years. And I think that, 
when you see one thing like that, if you don't change your frame of reference to, to see other avenues as having that exact same path. And this is why I came back to basketball because, um, cause you, you realize that like in order to get good at basketball, in order to be able to like jump high, you have to like build the muscle memory to do it. Going back, like one of the foundations, so I work at Explora Science Center in Albuquerque and one of the foundational, um, uh, pedagogy for Explora is uh, Dewey's. It's I think it's experiences in education. Yeah, okay, like yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so he basically writes, and this is like what you're better at the history than I am. It's like early 1900s, late 1800s. Late 1800s, I believe. Yeah. Uh, so basically, in the book, he talks about how um, in order for people, uh, in order for learners he, uh, to better absorb material. They have to like experience the learning. He basically establishes back then that just sitting and being dictated to and reading is not the most effective form of learning. Hmm. And that kind of changed the educational research on its head because anyway, so there's this, you know, my whole business is built on this building experiences so that people can have an earlier start at becoming scientists, mathematicians, computer coders and all that stuff. But now we're starting to add this new wrinkle into it, which is um, that you can, you know, you have those experiences, but you also have to kind of repeat those experiences in order to be able to start to build skill sets. And I think that the only way a person becomes prodigious is when there's like inside of a person, it's like the repetition kind of just happens to perfectly overlap with your like enjoyment in that activity because if you don't really like it you're not going to want to do it again right and so like bill gates wouldn't have found that founded microsoft if it wasn't for the fact that one he was you know initially kind of good at this probably because he was like good at math and he liked math in school but and two he was like oh this is interesting and now i'm just going to like pour all of my time into this and then bam microsoft was founded five minutes later yeah no, I'm, I'm really glad. I definitely think this applies to the basketball, but I do want to take a second and encourage people to do their math homework <laughs> because uh, <laughs> I, I, as a young person, I excelled really well in math and I always thought I had a natural gift and it was such that um, I didn't think I needed to practice. I was on math teams and stuff like that and would just kind of show up to competitions and try and, and beat everybody. But I... Uh, as I got older and as the math got harder, of course, I slipped suddenly to the middle and then the back of the pack. And part of it was because I hadn't developed the work ethic. And reflecting on it now, growing up, my dad, who's an engineer, uh, did a lot of math puzzles with me as a kid. And we had all these puzzle books around. So I spent a lot of time thinking about numbers and relationships to, uh, of numbers and shapes and things like that. So uh, when I got into pre-algebra and, and algebra, I had already been exposed to a lot of that stuff. It wasn't new to me like it was to everybody else. And so I just thought I, I naturally got it really quickly. And I had a teacher that graced me with the ability to skip ahead. I didn't skip grades. I just, um, you know, in my algebra class was looking at calculus books. Um, so it gave me an advantage that wasn't natural. <laughs> you know, it wasn't innate. I just had the advantage of getting to spend time on a topic early without, without other distractions. <laughs> And then when I got to college and everybody was at that level and had spent time with those books, all of a sudden that advantage was gone and I didn't have the work ethic to, uh, to continue to excel. So there is something to people saying, I'm not good at math. It's not my thing. And you may not be interested in it, but that's not the same thing as not being able to do it, right? Nobody can do it until they practice it and learn it. Yeah, I think that's um, really well articulated. And, and the reason why, like, uh, I like the way you said it is because um, it's not really a discouragement. Like I'm basically going out on a limb and saying that there's no such thing as like innate talent uh, and that you have to, you have to like have an interest in something, but then you also have to pour in the effort. And there's a whole bunch of careers now where um, because the internet has enabled people to have access to doing these sorts of things, that now we're finding that like there's a whole bunch more jobs that it's not just about who you know, but you also can have a skill in that and get into the industry that way. And I'm talking about 
um, the movie industry, um, the animation industry, which to me is like a whole four. How do you even get into animation without knowing somebody? Um, but now there's like, you know, people are showing their videos online. There's a whole bunch of tools that are free and you can practice on your own and start to develop the skills. And then you just kind of keep taking the next step until you are in a point where you're like, oh, I can actually do this for a job. Whereas before it was like you go to school and you get a, you know, you get your high school diploma, but you had like one of eight subjects that you liked a lot. And then you go to college and you think that, okay, I have a math degree or I have a history degree. I can only go into math or history. Mm. And now we're finding that there's a lot more paths because having access earlier gives you like a clearer picture of what, what you can actually do. It's not just about like either believing that you have talent or working really hard, but you also have to find something you're kind of passionate, passionate about. Yeah. So the last um, couple of episodes, we spent a lot of time talking only about basketballers, and this this uh, episode's going to have very little basketball in it. But I think we're laying the groundwork. I want to I want to discuss just briefly about Aristotle's notion of skill and, and virtue, um, just because I think we've touched on so many important topics here that will set up future conversations about basketball, about pop culture, and yes, about philosophy. So. Um, Aristotle uh, was worried or was focused on how to have a good city of good humans and what does it mean to be a good human being. Uh, and he didn't mean that just in the moral sense, but like what is a fully functional, ideal human being like uh, physically, mentally, uh, socially, and, and morally? So uh, the idea that, that I want to focus on is this idea of erethe, the uh, idea of virtue, not as a moral concept. You know, we tend to think of virtues as patience and honesty and courage, but but virtue in the sense of being good at something and developing uh, the proficiency in a certain area. So you can be a virtuous archer if you have the skill to be able to hit your mark. You can be a virtuous uh, salesman if, if you have the charisma and develop the the techniques to be able to convince people to buy your product. So virtue in this sense is um, is related to skill, and we might think that it's an innate talent. But he really, um, Aristotle pointed out that every skill, every virtue is related to a function, an ergon. So you can't just be a good person. You're good at something, right? You have to be hitting the mark. You have to be aiming towards some goal and, and be good at achieving that goal. So an honest person is virtuous in the sense that they are good at discerning when and how to tell the truth uh, and, and not to disseminate and lie. Um, somebody is virtuous. At, again, I'll go to the example. Well, let's talk about basketball. You can be virtuous in a lot of different ways. We can talk about a good three-point shooter. Uh, and they may not necessarily be the best defender or the most athletic person, but they can still be a good player because we think of them specifically in terms of one skill that they're really good at. So if we think of virtues, oh, clever. yeah, exactly. If we break virtues up from this general vague category of just being good into good at, I think it, it opens up a lot more ways for us to evaluate and assess how good someone is at something or, or how good something is for its purpose. And, and that might help break us out of this, like, vague everybody's good at something everybody's uh everybody's good that therefore we have no reason to judge or evaluate anything that's really interesting it it makes me think of this thing that i've been thinking about for the past few weeks which is like a let's just define it as like the american culture is like it used to be you work really hard and you can achieve whatever you want but now it's sort of becoming like a, an entitlement. It's like, I'm here and I'm in front of you doing this. Why aren't I getting the credit for it? Mm. It's kind of been flipped on its head. Whereas um, I'm going to use anime as an example because I watch a lot of it and have a lot of experience with it. But like almost every protagonist in Japanese anime, or at least a lot of the main ones, they are very flawed, right? And their whole, like, the whole story arc is about them basically perf putting in the time and effort to perfect their craft. Mm. And so, like, in the beginning, they're, like, as you define, they're not virtuous at all. They're actually, like, the opposite. And they're probably an antagonist in the beginning. But through hard work and perseverance, they, like, 
basically they have this one goal and that one goal is like what sets them on this path throughout their whole life. And you watch Naruto of like 1200 episodes and Dragon Ball Z of 900 episodes and one punch man of 24 episodes, you know, but they're all, they're all pointing to this one, this one pathway of like, I want to be this thing and I will not stop until I get it. And then they have to go through essentially a test that proves that they are who they say they are. And, you know, the test varies at every level. You know, in the beginning, it's like somebody who is more more in tune with their skills. But at the end, it's somebody who you think nobody could possibly overcome. And then here comes the hero. And he's just like, I've spent my whole life having this never give up attitude. And that's really all I bring to the table. So I'm not going to give up until I overcome this issue here. Yeah, It's just like a start a really stark contrast in style. And uh, I think that the American culture, uh, at least in the education system, would change greatly if if we can instill that work hard attitude, the uh, I can achieve it. There's, I'm not just born with this talent. I just happen to have a prior experience that makes me think I do. Oh man, that's so good. That's such a good lesson. I, I know that our listeners are on the edge of their seat and they want more, but... <laughs> You know, it is what it is. 